recording pause. There you go. Good job. Okay. We are recording. It says it in my upper screen. So if it's not recording, it's Gary's fault. <laughs> so welcome everyone. I got to do what Gary did. Welcome. Oops, I got to spell it right. Hi, Bernetta. Welcome and happy Monday. So uh, Gary's uh, doing, he's still at the zoning meetings up in Pennsylvania. I don't know if he's ever going to, if they're ever going to let him out of Pittsburgh. So welcome everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. We're going to be working off of a uh, PowerPoint presentation this evening that uh, Susan and I are going to be hosting. So Susan, can you see the PowerPoint? I can. <laughs> That's cool. All I just right. want to tell you all that I was kind of along for a ride. This whole thing was Tom. He's done so, so well. And I've learned a lot from him this week. Um, OK. <laughs> so if it goes well. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Liz. Hi, Ursula. <laughs> so welcome, everyone. So uh, Gary, uh, a couple weeks ago uh, at the GAG, at the gig debrief, Gary told us that uh, the June 7 meeting, he wasn't going to be uh, able to host it. So um, he voluntold Susan. <laughs> And then Susan said, well, That's Tom. <laughs> I, I'm dragging Tom into this too. <laughs> yeah. But it, it was a, it, it was a good experience for both of us uh, mm -hmm. because we, we actually both had to jump into our MLSs, uh, find information that we currently weren't looking for and uh, analyze it for this evening. Um, and it was actually a surprise for me because a couple months ago I was pulling similar data for an investor in Charlottesville and a lot of the properties were on the market at this point um, and they've since sold, which is um, because of the price point, I was kind of surprised by it. Uh, and we're going to touch on that this evening. So let's see. So um, what Gary asked us to do was to, to kind of help give you some tools and talk about tools that we would use to uh, create evaluation for, uh, and we, we determined a duplex because uh, Susan and I both had access to duplexes in our markets uh, and uh, different uh, valuation approaches, uh, some different multipliers or rates to consider. Uh, and then pull up live examples. And Susan actually has a, a really good one at the end that uh, we're gonna test everyone on. So I was hoping that David Edwards was gonna be on this call. Uh, it might be good that he's not because he could tell me that I'm saying everything incorrectly. Mm -hmm. uh, but David is one of our team resources. He's got a, a, a background in appraisals. And so he knows it uh, backwards and forwards. So there's three types of approaches um, when an appraiser is gonna be looking at a property. Uh, one of them is gonna be the cost approach. And that's where you take, you, you assign a value for the land, uh, the development, which is gonna be your infrastructure, your structure on it, and then you subtract depreciation. So this is not typically an approach used for an, an income producing multi-unit property. Uh, and feel free to chat in or jump in audio wise, at, you know, if you have anything to add on that. Because um, this is a, this is a class, it's not a lecture hall. So the comparison approach for all of us that work with single family homes, uh, this is what we see typically in an appraisal where the, the appraiser is going to try to find three comparable sales um, within the last 30 days in the neighborhood. And then, you know, they've got uh, guidelines as far as moving out from there. Uh, Susan and I are both and tend to be in a little more rural area. So we've seen appraisals pro stretch out into outlying counties as well. Uh, so, but with uh, income producing properties, 
and especially multi-unit properties, it's tougher to find sales comps, uh, which are closer in. So while it can be used, uh, it can be a challenge uh, both for the uh, agent and also for, for the appraiser. And so a lot of times it's going to be the income approach. And um, that's anytime a property is used for rent or lease. And so it's analyzing your net operating income, the capitalization rate, and we're going to talk about that, gross rent multipliers, uh, and then we've got a couple other data points uh, that help us establish a value for a subject property. Um, so question before we move on, typically when, when I'm valuing a property, I will try to use as many approaches as possible um, to help let me know if I'm getting close to a good value valuation because I share that uh, with my potential seller or, or a buyer too, to say, based on these figures and these approaches, capitalization rate, uh, gross rent multiplier, uh, comparable sales if they're available. And I present all that information to my client so that they're taking, they can make an educated decision on whether this is a good buying opportunity or selling opportunity. So what are, what are you all doing or seeing And we can stay here all night. <laughs> Are you doing similar stuff? Liz, one, one thing real quick. Liz, I am having trouble promoting you to panelists, but you're you are available to talk. OK. All right, so we'll cut you some slack there. So capitalization rate, that's, uh, that is calculated by dividing your net operating income of a, a, a property that you're considering or using as a, as a comp uh, divided by the purchase price or the offer, offer price. So the NOI, it's, um, that's calculated by your gross income less your operating expenses. An important, important point to note, it does not include debt service. Uh, debt service, when you subtract that from everything, gives you your cash flow. So um, you'll, you may read in different places where it's included. When you're, you're calculating the NOI, if you use the rental profit calculator that uh, Gary provides us, uh, it, it plugs everything in for you. And so the, the cap rate is really going to vary by locality, um, by property type. So uh, duplexes, triplexes, quads, and then into apartment buildings are going to have, uh, they will have different cap rates based on, based on your market because they're different type properties. Uh, and so you can Google cap rates for your market and you're going you're gonna to find some numbers and some sources for numbers set those aside, pull that information and set it aside, but do your own research. So if, if you're looking at um, quadplexes, you know, four unit um, uh, property for a, a potential purchaser or you have someone who's selling, get the data yourself, use that data and come up with your own cap rate. And, and it's gonna be a cap rate range. So it may run, five to six and a half or seven to eight uh, and track that maybe once a quarter, just go in and pull up some data and, and run the numbers and see if your cap rate range uh, is holding or if it adjusts one way or the other. Um, and that's gonna vary um, depending on the market, uh, but it's a good thing to have your own data. Uh, I don't do, um, I don't do guesswork when I'm working with clients. I give them data and then I let them make the decisions that are best for them based on their, their goals. So again, your cap rate is your NOI divided by your purchase price. And that's gonna vary. Uh, and if, you, if you're, let's say you, you've been able to determine a general cap rate for your market 
and for your property type. So let's say it's 6% and you've got a property that you're looking to price uh, and you've got some of the data on real estate taxes, what insurance is going to cost, general uh, property management, if it runs 10% or so, you can, you can arrive at a, an estimated NOI for that property if you've got the rental information, what it's renting for, divide it by your area cap rate, and that can give you a potential property value, another tool in your tool bag to help you determine if the uh, determine a value for the property. So if you're looking to list a property to help your seller decide on a on a list range, uh, and then also uh, if you're trying to determine if um, you know, a property that's already out there uh, is something worthwhile to pursue further and investigate further and get more information on. So generally, a lower, the lower cap rate, and this is just general, a lower cap rate is going to tell you that you have a better quality property, uh, potentially in a, in a stronger market, and there's going to be less risk involved in that. Uh, the higher cap rate properties might be your, your uh, B or C type um, properties. So they offer you a better return, but they also, they may need some upgrades, some deferred maintenance. Uh, there may also be some higher risk involved in that. So depending on what you or your client are looking for, you know, you may have a client that says, I really want an eight to 10% cap rate property. So they're not gonna be looking at some of the examples that we're gonna be showing this evening because they're in the five to six range. Uh, and you know, let your client make that decision there. But knowing that number is gonna help a lot. The gross rent, rent multiplier, you're gonna see that listed in a lot of in, investment strategies. Be careful using that. Uh, especially as a, as a standalone tool. You can use it as a quick identifier for potential value. So the gross rent uh, multiplier is taking the purchase price of the property and dividing it by the annual gross rental income. And it gives you a, a quick um, number on it and it'll give you a range. So it might be from 10 to 12. And I, I'm going to show you a little bit. So the gross rent for, for an area times your gross annual rent can give a property valuation range. So if you know a couple pieces of information, so if you've already created your GRM for your market and for duplexes or triplexes, then you know it's 10 to 12 and you know annual rents are 30,000 a year for comparable properties you know that your property, a property valuation is going to be in the neighborhood of 300 to $360,000. That's just using the, the 10 to 12 GRM range that you've determined from prior sales. And you know that average rents for duplexes the annual are going to be about $30,000 a year. So you know that most similar properties are going to run between 300 and 360,000. With that said, uh, don't bank on just the GRM figure. That's another tool in your toolbox uh, to help uh, either confirm that, yes, we're in the market looking at cap rates and other data, uh, but don't use it exclusively. Uh, and generally, it tells an investor how many years it's going to take to get their money back without um, taking into consideration any operating expenses. So it's just a quick, uh, dirty range that, uh, that you can use to help see if a property is worth looking into further. Any questions, comments? All right, so I wanted to give some definitions beforehand. And then many of us have heard the 1% rule. Uh, I know Chris Latham, uh, has used that over on the West Coast. Uh, I have an investor uh, who's been in, in the Charlottesville market for 40 years, and he talks about the 100 times rule, which is the same thing as a 1% rule. So, um, and what that is, is 
let's say your rent is $2,000 a month on this particular investment property that you're looking at. Uh, a purchase price, a comparable purchase price should be 200,000. So 10 times the monthly rent. Be very, very, very cautious of that figure. Charlottesville runs from 140 to over 200 times the monthly rent. So if I've got an investor and he's using the 1% rule, he's gonna miss out on every potential property in the Charlottesville market. Find out what your multiplier is in your market. Uh, just using the, the same data there uh, and looking at prior sales. And uh, also, you know, I, I come up with the multiplier for single family homes, duplexes, triplexes, and quads in my market. So if I've got somebody looking for it and they're saying, hey, Tom, I'm looking at something in the outlying county to Charlottesville, it's a duplex. Uh, the um, monthly rent multiplier is 150. What do you think just off the top of your head without looking at any other numbers? And I'd say, yeah, it's probably something worthwhile to look further in because it runs 150 to 170 in the outlying county. I've got that data, I can tell him. So it's, an, it's another piece of the puzzle that you can use. Uh, don't stress over this, but be very, very cautious applying just the 1% rule. Know, what, know your market. Um, I have a yes. question. Can you go back to that for a second? So in your market then, are people buying multifamily properties with um, negative cash flow? Yes. Okay, so they, they're banking on the thing appreciating. Mm, no, <laughs> because, and, and they, yeah, yeah. Um, the, a couple of the examples that I'm using this evening and in my final spreadsheet, three of the properties have a negative cash flow. So their investment strategy is gonna be different because I can tell that they're also buying at the top of the market. So they're putting, unless they make a change, um, you know, unless the property has the potential to, let's say there's one meter for water and electric and they can separate meters and the owner's, you know, not covering that. Or if there's an improvement they can make to increase their rents. Uh, but with what I'm seeing right now, um, whoever has purchased those properties they are looking at off potentially, you know, the depreciation factor, which they can carry over to other properties. So they're not, whoever's bought those properties, this is not the only property that they're handling uh, because the numbers just don't work. It's not a cash flow positive property. And un unless they're coming with much more cash down. So I used, in my examples, I used 80% loan. So if, if they're putting 50% down, then yes, they, they will be cash flow pr positive properties. And the, the rental profit calculator that, that, uh, that we have access to, you can run different scenarios. So when someone's looking at something, if they've got the resources to it, then yeah, it, it very well could be. But just based on an 80 per 20% down payment, three of my um, properties are cash flow negative. So some, there, there's something else missing in, in that. Did I answer that? Yes, thank you. Okay. So when we're trying to find or establish a value for a potential listing, the more of your own data that you have and you've assembled and you just keep, keep, it, keep it in your, in your database somewhere, the easier it is for you to, to quickly help a potential buyer or a potential seller of a, of a property. And you're gonna be uh, the go-to person for that information too. Um, recent comparable sales can help tremendously if there's sufficient apples to apples. So if you can find one or two that help, and, and that's another tool that you can bring in the valuation, that can be great. Uh, nine to 12 months ago in the Charlottesville market, it was extremely difficult to find any kind of comparable sales. Uh, over the last two weeks, as Susan and I have been preparing, I found some. So that, that was a surprise to me. 
Um, what are the, okay, you're gonna tell us what the, yep. the, the data you want us to keep, our cap rates, CRMs, and, and monthly rent multipliers? Is that what you're yep. saying? Yes, yeah. And, and you, can, you can decide what works for you, but those, that's information that you can, uh, you can do once a quarter and then you just check and, and you look at the trend on it. So you can tell people, well, over the last three years and, and you know, looking in your MLS, you can go back a little bit in time and pull up historical data and run the numbers for it and say, you know, back in 2018 and 2019, our cap rates were running six to seven and a half percent for duplexes. Currently, they're five to six and a half percent. So that what's that telling us? You know, even in the same market, it's telling us that that prices are appreciating uh, if everything else is staying the same. Uh, but that's that, that's valuable information that your investor clients don't have. Um, and of course, having accurate income and expense data for your subject property, that, that's going to key as you're drilling down for sp specific property. Uh, property condition and the potential where you can increase the value of the property uh, to increase rents or increase the property valuation. So potential upgrades to the property that you can make um, neglected maintenance that you go in and, and update, which weren't rent increases. So thinking of those things as well. And then each client is different. So they all have different goals. For some of them, positive cash flow is not the highest priority. For me, it definitely would be because I don't, uh, you know, I don't want to bring extra resources in to keep a property going, but there could be other strategies to use. So if, if the property looks really good and there's very few properties coming on the market and it fits everything else, you may have another uh, partner come in who uh, just brings in equity to it so that it's uh, that, that the numbers work. So there's lots of different ways and use Gary. Gary is, is um, great in running the different ideas on how to make a property work. So if, if, you're, if you think a property is going to work and you've got your numbers and you're not sure, I would recommend sending that on to Gary. Let him take a look at it and let him do some what ifs for you. So have you considered this, this, and this? Uh, and he's been very good on, on uh, getting to you quickly with that information. So we're going to look at some duplexes in the Charlottesville market. I was able to find side-by-side -side duplexes. So I was comparing apples to apples. And we're going to, uh, I determine the cap rates, the GRMs, the monthly rent uh, multipliers. And then I've got two active listings that are uh, side-by-sides. And we're going to look at the ranges from prior sales and see if the ranges uh, fit in with the current active listings. Basically, I'm going to ask you if you think the agent has them overpriced, underpriced, or comparably priced. Uh, and then would this be, a, as Mo would say, would this be a deal or no deal? So the first property, it's a pending listing. I think it just closed. I haven't pulled up the current data. Um, side by side duplex, uh, 750 square feet, two bedrooms, one bath, 750 square feet, finished base, unfinished basement. List price is 395. It went under contract in five days. Um, very, uh, you know, it was a long-term rental, um, very nice property from a, an, an investment standpoint. So I plugged in on the rental profit calculator, get familiar with this, play with the numbers. There are a lot of um, equations uh, already put in there. So if you plug in certain numbers, it, it populates a lot of the rest of the um, calculator sheet. So the example that I used is I did an 80% loan for acquisition cost uh, just to maintain everything consistent across the board. I took 2% of the purchase price. Hey, Tom, so, can I ask yes. a question? Yes. 
You keep saying 80%. Where do you get a 20% down investor loan? I'm finding only 25%. Um, well, you, but that's a very good question. Um, and it's, I can answer that question. Yep. Yeah. So it depends on your experience. Mm -hmm. So th there are lenders that will allow you to do a lower down uh, as long as you have some experience. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I'll say 30% um, thirty percent or more for a, a new investor. And that tends to lead them towards non-commercial banking opportunities. Um, so yes, but thank you, Christina. That, that was that was good catching, helping me out there. Uh, so just for the sake of the the example there, so we could we could adjust it to twenty five, uh, uh, you know, seventy five percent loan. Um, for the sake of numbers, I use an interest rate of five percent, amortized over thirty years. Uh, you see twenty years a lot as well, uh, depending on on what you want to do. Um, it doesn't affect the. The cap rate it doesn't affect the gross rent multiplier. It does uh, affect your debt service ratio, uh, which will affect your cash flow. So, um, and you know, we we were uh, Gary wanted us to focus more on property valuations than on cash flow. So we just use placeholders for those figures. Uh, so looking at the bottom part of the screen. Uh, we had a net op operating income of 22,000, a cap rate of 5.8%. Down here in small print, and I, I don't worry about this because I put it on a spreadsheet. I calculated the gross rent multiplier. Um, the next one is a sold property, side by side duplex. This was all above ground, uh, so there was no basement on it. The gross rent was comparable, 28,800. 28,800. Most of these, the, their gross annual rents uh, were about $30,000. Uh, this was 30, 31,200. Um, and oops, okay. So my cap rate was 5.7%, net operating income 22,000. And I didn't, so I actually was able to pull five sold listings. Uh, I just used two for example, cause we could be here for quite a while. And Susan's got some, some great um, properties to go through. So I put them on a spreadsheet, um, my pendings and solds, running them across the price, their gross rent, their NOI, their gross rent multiplier, their cap rate, this was the 1% rule. So as you see, the range for uh, this, uh, this is close in city of Charlottesville is 12 and a half to 14.9 to a GRM versus 10% uh, versus a 10, which would be a, uh, a one, a, the 1% rule. And then just a quick uh, cash flow. And so I came up with a range and averages for those. And I'm going to transfer that over. We're going to look at the um, two active listings. So this is a um, over under. No, this is this is a I think it's a side by side. Yeah, yeah. it's a side by side duplex. Gross rent still the same. Thirty one thousand. Pretty darn pretty, pretty close. Um, I came up with the numbers that I was able to pull a 5.9% cap rate. Uh, this one is an active listing. Uh, it's another side by side duplex. 495 is the price point. It's an active listing. 222 days on market. Yes, 222 days on market. And so this is this is going to be the, uh, the the fun one. A uh, little higher. Annual rent thirty four thousand, cap rate of five point four percent, so it's trending down lower. Uh, and actually, where cap rates were back in the fall, 
when I was looking at this particular property, they were in the fours. So I did, I took those two properties and then I took my average cap rate from my pendings and solds uh, and then worked the numbers backwards. So I knew what the net operating income was. I divided it by the average cap rate for the Charlottesville market, which I, I think we had, was it 5.3? Uh, so I took the NOI, divided it by 5.3, and it gave me a value of 437. So if I'm just looking at what the asking price is for it, comparing it to the, the averages of what has recently gone under contract and sold, the ones that have gone under contract, they're going to sell pretty much at their list price. So those numbers are less than, than this price. On the Longwood property, the one that was on the market for 224 days, a couple of the figures are lower than what he's asking for the property. One of them is just slightly higher. So then what do you guys think on these two active listings? Are they okay just, just from a valuation standpoint? Yes, no, depends. Yeah, okay, so we got a yes there. Yeah, they, they fit in the range. And then the next question, Mo would say, deal or no deal? So your cash flow, and this, this is on an 80, 20, or you know, an 80% loan are fairly low. And if I had run uh, cash on cash um, returns, these numbers would be lower percentages. And Susan's gonna to touch on that in a minute. Um, so potentially, so Longwood, and this is, this is what I mentioned earlier. This was an investor who was liquidating seven of his duplexes on the same street. Uh, back in the fall, all seven were on the market and I ran cap rates and they were running about four and a half percent on his properties. And my investor said, this guy's crazy. So, but over the last five, five to six months, he has sold five of the six and these were his sold prices. So he's getting the numbers that he was asking for. Now his rental figures came up a little bit, which helped the cap rate change. And I think that may have uh, changed the minds on some investors who were looking at it, but it's still, you've, you've got to have, you've got to be, uh, know what you're doing to look at these kind of properties. The only difference on this last one is it didn't have a brick facade. The other five properties, duplexes had brick facades, but they were on the same block. So we are gonna look at the Lynchburg market and I'm gonna be the slide clicker. Susan, it's yours. All right. So you guys, this is my first time into this. And um, one of the things I would like to do is just show you all through that, that um, rental properties calculator, just in case you guys haven't used it yet. I know that if, if Gary's told, if Gary's hit it two or three times, it starts to sink in for me. So we'll do that when we get to that slide. I, um, actually, Tom, can you get us to, well, I'll, I'll stay here. So I, I was kind of going about it in a little different way because I, I am so new to this. So I made mine more homogenous and I had just learned about um, cap rates and cash on cash. So I, I did that calculation for mine, whereas Tom did the other ones. So that's part of mine. But anyway, so cash on cash return, um, basically it tells you what, you know, your percentage return you're getting on your money. So you take um, the annual cash flow, which is gonna be at the bottom of our sheet, and you divide that by the money that you have into it, which is both the down payment plus the acquisition costs, which are generally closing costs. And that, that, that gets the yield that an investor can consider um, as part of figuring out if it's a good return or not. And Tom's got this here, you know, are you gonna go into real estate or do you think you can get a better deal with some other investment vehicle? So we'll be going, we'll be doing cash on cash returns with mine just because I did them. 
All right, so again, what I was interested in looking at in my market was just to start analyzing what was happening in my market. So um, I grouped these a little bit more by area and, you know, I guess, you know, I wanted to see how the cap rates, if they actually would work, because I know the better areas and the better properties versus some of the other areas. So I was particularly interested in that. So we're going to start here on Old Forest Road. And these, um, I had a listing last year and these, these properties and mine was comparable to it. We lasted on the market for at least four or five months. And so I found it interesting that these things are selling a lot better nowadays. So this is a side-by-side -side newer duplex. In my, my market, we have a lot of the duplexes are, are older homes that people have split into two families. All right, so you can go on. So this is Old Forest Road. You can see how fast this one went. It actually went, um, it went pending and in one day. And in our market, it just shows that it closed after only being on the market for one day. So that was very interesting to me because that means things have changed substantially. So right now, before we go any further, I do, I do wanna just show you around on this calculator. Um, and I will say that I pretty much homogenized mine because I wasn't exactly looking for um, really in-depth things. I was just trying to get sort of a macro view of how this worked. So on this side, um, I basically was keeping track for my own self about how long things were on the market, whether they went pending, whether they were camping on the market, whether they, how fast they closed. And we'll come back to cash on cash return because it doesn't actually go here. I just put it here because there wasn't a place on here to do it. <laughs> I didn't really care about tracking even the condition or the square, the price per square foot. I really wasn't concerned about that. So, or even the age, so I was really just doing the duplexes. Now over here, we start to work on, um, you know, some of the numbers to do our, uh, calculating on the investment. So I just assumed every one of these was gonna be a full price offer. And I also did a 20%, an 80% loan to value, just to have that be the, the same thing for every one of them. And like Tom, because he was doing a 2% closing cost, I just mimicked that too, for the sake of the, of the exercise. So our total acquisition is here. This is closing cost plus 20% down. And then, then it's gonna auto-populate to an extent. So again, so I guess I did this wrong because I was saying the initial loan was, was 199.9 and Tom I see corrected me, but I worked out the numbers. So I know that this periodic payment was the 969 and then this auto-populates. I chose a 20 year term. So I figured most investors would go for that. I thought, I'm not even sure you can do 30 um, years for investors around here. And I opted for a 4% rate. So all of that's just going to be homogenous throughout all of the things that I'm working on. Um, so Tom, question, go back to that one, if you would. So why did you put a loan of 159.920? Because it would really have been still 199.9, just minus the down payment. But we still actually form our numbers on the amount of the loan. Yeah, the um, the mortgage that's that's your amount of the loan, and and the calculator that that Gary gives us, when you plug in the mortgage amount, it adds your um, it, it takes the purchase price sub, subtracts your mortgage, and in the initial investment it adds that total to the initial investment. Say it again. So you've got. Um, it's actually the, a calculator. So you start with the 199.9 purchase price. Right. You've you've got to plug in the actual loan amount, which is that's an 80% loan. Um, and so that's going to subtract it from the 199 to give you the remainder figure. All right. So you know, with a regular mortgage, even though you are putting down, for instance, 20%, you're still going to borrow at the purchase price. So that's why I'm, I'm surprised that you did that. I had this back at 199 
both in these two spots. Yeah. Um, this is uh, this section right here is just to create uh, to give you the figure of your initial investment. OK, so that's down payment plus acquisition cost. Correct. All right, you guys. So then this one is going to auto populate for us down below. We'll, we'll get to that in just a second. Again, I'm not caring about square foot at all. Um, and basically, um, I broke this out. Tom, I see Tom came back and cleaned up behind me again. So um, because not all of my two units were, um, were going to be at the same price, I split this out into one apartment, one apartment, and I changed these, which then auto populated the amounts of rent here and added them up here. This then, this price here, the total rent is going to come down to the bottom part of this and it's going to populate here. It's going to automatically take out your vacancy rate. And so this is your gross operating income. So now we're going to go down to the bottom of the sheet. This is the top. So here's the bottom of the sheet. So now we're going to take out the operating expenses. One thing that I did wrong and did a whole bunch of these and then realized I was doing it wrong because I here I was adding, I was adding in, I'm sorry, Tom, can you go up top one more time? I was putting in um, this amount, including, I was doing PITI instead of just PI here, which, which then I realized that was messing me all up. So I had to go back and switch them. So back down to the bottom again, um, we're gonna now add the taxes and insurance here. So again, you guys, because I wanted to homogenize this because I was really kind of trying for a, a different um, data point than, than Tom was doing because I'm just learning it. I just kept all of my taxes the exact same. And I kept all of my management fees of 10% of the, um, the gross income. And then I just didn't even, even though I didn't populate any of these fields, even though it would have been a great idea, but I just didn't have enough data from the listing sheets to do it justice. I only had a couple of them. So I thought I'm just going to completely eliminate that whole thing. And so that is how I came up with the net, the total operating expenses. Of course, the total rent minus the expenses gets you the NOI here. Then taking out the debt service, we get to the cash flow before taxes. All right, so now we're going to figure out the cap rate. So you guys tell me how you figure out cap rate. <laughs> What's the formula? Net operating income divided by purchase price. Right, and so I kept saying that to myself to get it into my head because it takes me a while to do that. So th that is correct. And so here is our cap rate. Tom, I did discover that the, this thing did not auto-populate the cap rate. So talk, talk to me about that. Yeah, um, when you were forcing some changes up top. Okay, uh, oh, it, because of the-, the Yeah, um, it messed up the equation down gotcha. below. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. All right, and I was interested in the cash on cash thing, because obviously, you know, we do have some people who are looking for the cash flow like we learned a couple of weeks ago in this class. And then we also have somebody, you know, who's just looking at raw data because they're maybe a little bit better at it. So the cash on cash for this one was a 4.5%. As I go through, as I went through this, actually, I was also really interested to find that there is a pretty common rental that's happening in my market that I would not otherwise have guessed. And it was also lower than I thought because I'm right next to downtown and the rents down there are running about twice as much as they have been in the rest of these properties that I was examining. So that was a really good lesson for me as well knowing in knowing my market. So keep in mind, we have 18.6 here. Okay, so we'll move to our next one. All right, actually, um, we're going to come back to this property. Okay. So, yeah. Where do, well, where do we, we want to go to? Right now? We can do it right now, but we're going to come back to it at the end. So this property, you guys, just happens to be two doors down from me. And there's another property right next to it that we're going to look at um, at the very end here, too. So this is this, again, was really interesting to me. 
So it, we, this is in a historic district. Notice the age, we're in the 1880s in my neighborhood. So the, I didn't work on condition at all in my um, calculations either. So let's go to the RPC for this one. All right, so um, purchase price, it did close and it went under contract in three days, as you can see over here, and it closed for 170. It actually was listed for 138. So that was also a good thing to know. Um, so here you go, just are those calculations again, you've got your down payment plus your 2% closing costs. That's where we're coming up with, with that. And we're gonna plug it back in down below. And again, I did the 4% with the 20 years. And now we've got a 700 a month and a 750 a month for a total gross, in, gross income of 1740. Down here, again, we're gonna deduct out the 3% vacancy. So we've got our gross operating income at 16,878. We're gonna get down to the bottom of this one again, bottom of the page. And so we've got, I told you I'm doing the same tax for every one of them. Our real estate taxes on this one are 1440, which was also really interesting to me because it showed that the taxes downtown where I live are much higher than some of the other parts of the city, which is very interesting. So anyways, down here, we're getting to an NOI of 3980, taking out our debt service. And again, I, you know, I didn't really do much here with any of these expenses. And so I was surprised that the cash flows on these things were as low as they were. I thought they would be higher. So again, we're going to get back to our cap rate of 7.6%. And Tom, can you back up? I forgot our cash on cash. So that was 8%, which is not a bad return compared to a stock option. All right, so remember this. This is 210, 212 Harrison Street. It's a side-by-side -side duplex. All right, moving on. All right, now we're back to a much younger one again, 1968. And this one was only, again, one day on the market. So it was, you know, none of these things have been lasting on the market long at all. So let's look at this RPC. Um, so it went pending in one day. Now we're at the purchase price of 2099. So that was a newer one. It was probably in better condition. Um, so we're, we're taking out the 46178 is our total investment. And again, you know, you can just see, we don't have to go through every single step, but same, same, same. And, and look at this, they're both renting for 750. So there it is, 18,000. We've seen 18,000, we've seen 18,6. So again, same, same vacancy right here. And we'll go down to the bottom again. You guys getting how to use this um, sheet? Yes. Okay. Yes. That person is. <laughs> okay, great. All right. So here's our tax, um, 1954. Same, 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 same. We're down to a net op operating income of 12,906. Look at the cash flow. It's only $695. I was just really surprised that people would spend that much getting only that, that cash flow. Is anybody else surprised about that? You know, it kind of depends on what they're going to do with the property. Are they going to go in and rehab the inside to raise the rent or? I mean, that's all part of it, so. My yep, thought. yep. All right, so here's our cap rate, 6.1. And our cash on cash was what again? Tom is a 1.5, yeah. So that's that one surprised me. All right, moving on. Uh, can I ask a question? I, I don't know if you guys have seen a, a spike in the, in the um, property taxes after the sale. I know you, you're not considering that to keep it, you know, for the for the exercise, but I don't know how much is that impacting um, your... In Lynchburg, not whatsoever. We don't, we, they don't reappraise that way. They only come through and do the whole areas. They're constantly reappraising every year, but we only get reappraisals every four years. How about you in Charlottesville, Tom? Uh, they do it annually. 
and so they uh, they'll they'll start pulling the data from this summer for next year's uh, property valuations, property assessments. But like for the new for the new, the new owner, uh, would it be like a different you know set of rules, or would pretty much apply the same? No, in, in our market, the tax rate will stay the same. So let's say they, they have the property assessed at 300000 and it sells for 400000 The real estate taxes for the year are still on the 300000 Got it. Okay. So they don't, they don't change it due to a, a sales result. Okay. Okay. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. So you guys, I chose this next one on Gum Street specifically because I was really interested to see what would happen with the cap rate. As you can probably tell, this one is in a um, probably a B minus to C neighborhood, and it's list. It was listed for eighty nine thousand, and it went pending very quickly. Also, so let's take a look at this breakdown. So it went pending in three days. And it's only 89,000. So the initial investment is quite much lower than what we've been seeing. And look at the rents. It's still at 18,000. So we're going to take out the vacancy rate again. And so this is just very, very comparable to the other rents that we've been looking at. So let's look at the bottom and see how that compares. So same, 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 same. This is all the same. Um, I think Tom put these, I guess maybe I put these in just because these are paid by the seller. And I thought, I just wanted to see how much it skewed the numbers, which it didn't make a very big difference at all in the cap rate. No. But the, yeah, that was interesting too. And here's our NOI minus our debt service. And so look at the difference in that cash flow and that cap rate. And then the cash on cash return was quite sweet. <laughs> so interesting, huh? All right. I think that is that all I've got on. Yeah, okay. I love I love this spreadsheet that Tom put together just to be able to have a quick snapshot of everything. So I see you took out Gum Street because it's an outlier. It's an outlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So cap rates average was 6.8 and then um, GRM range is 10.73. And wow, I am so, so shocked to see that our 1% rule is also that much above. I, you remember that first one I showed you guys on Old Forest Road with a duplex and I had, I had a, a ranch, which was an up and down that had been turned into a duplex. And I hit that, I was on, I had that on the market for, it was close to five months. And it's because everybody, all the investors in my market were uninterested because they had, they were like so hooked on that 1% rule and we weren't at a 1% and eventually did sell it for more like this, but it took a while. Comments, anybody? Christine wants the information on the Gum Street property. It's under yeah. contract. Sure, I'll send it to you. Yeah, it is under contract. What was neat in that is... Yeah, Christina, I'll send it to you. Yeah, it, it was broken up as a duplex, but the owner, from what I could read in the agent's notes, was renting it by the bedroom. Yes, we have a lot of that going on in my town in those neighborhoods because they can get away with it. Um, for a while anyways, before yeah. we all finds out. And yeah, it is pretty amazing because they're renting the bedrooms with horrifying kitchens and bathrooms because they're a disaster. Yeah. And they're renting them for $500 a room. Yeah. I went into one, my, the first time I ever went to show one of those, I was so appalled because in our house, you know, in our town, in our old houses, sometimes there's just a tiny little room at the top of the stairs with a window and it's probably four by six. And there was a guy in there with a speaker and a mattress and he was paying $500 a month. And I swore that I would work for people in, you know, poorer people that they not have to do that. So yeah, I was pretty upset. <laughs> but it happens all the time. And, and honestly, it does serve a purpose because there are an awful lot of people in my town 
with bad credit and they can't get into any other housing. And so they are so grateful to be able to rent a room for $500 a month. Yeah. Alexandra asked well, if we could explain the 1% rule again. Sure. Yeah. So that's when the, if you know what the rent is, then you don't want to pay more than 100% that times um, for the purchase price. So in my case, my house on Confederate, I should have put it on here actually, but it was past six months old. So I was, um, I had it for sale for 179.9, which is a steal. I mean, even as a single family house, that would have been a steal, but the rents, because the um, owner had just done a deal. I mean, he didn't really care. It had been under contract. Um, well, I'm sorry, it had been rented by a construction company for several many years where they just had people using the rooms as they came in and out of town. Plus his son was renting for free in the bottom. So, I mean, they, the, the rents did not show high enough to support that 1% rule. And it eventually did have to get a lot closer to the 1% rule. So the seller was paying the water and the electricity, meaning the heat pump, the heat and the cooling, and he was charging underpriced rents. So that just hurt, really hurt me in my town to get that thing sold for what it should have gotten sold for. Yeah. So Christina uh, chatted in, it's 1% of the sales price. So it, yeah. if you're looking at a house that's 250,000, you want to get rents just using the 1% rule of at least 2,500, 1% of the purchase price. Right. If you know the rents, so if you know that that this duplex is renting for 1500 a month, then a uh, using the 1% rule, multiply the 1500 times 100 gives you a purchase price valuation of 150,000. But be very, very careful using that um, calculation. Most of the values are higher. And as, as you see in Lynchburg, just with the properties that, that uh, Susan used, they ran 117 to 140 times higher than, than what it was running for. All right, moving on. Okay, so here's another one that, that was active. It came out the day Tom and I started working on these things and it was for 225. And I wondered how long it was going to last. We don't actually have very many duplexes in our town, especially ones that were built as duplexes. So let's see how this one fared with the numbers. This went under contract in six days. It's in a nice side of town. And the purchase price was 225. So the initial investment between the 20% down and the closing cost is 49.5. So we're getting up there. Look at the rents. We're still only at 18,000. It's still only 750 each. Why would somebody have paid 225 for this one? Well, part of it's area, but anyways, let's go on down. So we have the vacancy rate taken out. And again, I did just didn't really do much of anything um, with the you know operating expenses. I just wasn't really going for that quite as much. So our NOI is 14,000 to 21 minus debt service, at least there's still a positive cash flow at the end. So our cap rate is 6.3 and go back up to cash on cash is 2.3. So they paid a lot more for it. They still did have positive cash flow and they were content. Okay, here is, okay, now we're gonna get into some fun. I chose this one because I wanted to see how this one would fare in the numbers. You can see it's listed for 184.9. And this one was bought by a guy, he first, it was, a, it was a fun duplex. It had been split into a duplex. It's just an old house on one of my favorite streets in town. And um, it was pretty big wreck when we got there, but it was livable. It was just really bad cosmetically. So this guy was going to rent it out by the room. He furnished it to rent out by the room. And then he abandoned his listing agent and, and put it up for sale by owner. And now he's using one of those, those other listing agents that just make you call the owner. Um, <laughs> so here it is at 184.9. And initially when that came out at 184.9, I thought the guy's dreaming on, he's never gonna get that for that house. He bought it for like 111, if I, don't, if I remember correctly. So um, I just was really interested to see what he should have it on for. So I wanted to do this analysis. 
Plus we have almost no actives on in our market anyways. And Tom wanted me to get some actives. So here we are, <laughs> we're at 103 days on market, but historically not really. It had already been on that long before this other listing agent got it. So that's really interesting. Why, why, why is it sitting? Okay, so um, we've got a $40,678 initial investment and we're gonna plug that in. And um, yeah, so I also just went with 750 a month on those. So we're still at the exact same. It looks like everyone we're doing is pretty much pulling right around 18,000 for gross rents. So, okay, let's go down and see the rest. So we're down to an NOI of 13.6, take out the debt service. And look at that. It actually turned out to be doing better than some of the other investments. So the cap rate's a little bit higher. That does reflect that part of Rivermont that is by the old 20 year realtors, um, it's lower Rivermont, which is uh, you know not, not the more desirable area, but all the people moving in and all the students sticking around from Liberty University don't know that. So what is our cash on cash on this one? It's 5.9. So now I've changed my mind, honestly. I don't think it's a terrible price at 184.9, but obviously the rest of the market thinks so because it's still sitting here. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think about this one? how they're all the same rent and they're all in different areas of the city. I That's do too. To me. I was really surprised. Because where I live, it's not like that at all. I didn't think it was here either. I'm very, very surprised. All right, let's move along. Okay. So this is the fun one, you guys. So I remember earlier, I was we were looking at the one that's two doors down from me, which is um, on Harrison Street, and it's sold for 170. So now the house, which is right next door to me, which I should have put a picture in, sorry. Um, <laughs> so it belongs to my best friend from New Hampshire, and she bought it, and my um, my significant other and I spent multiple hours for free renovating it, um, trying to protect her from the terrible decisions she was making from New Hampshire. And guess who's still managing it, darn it. So, um, I'm so grateful and happy that she decided she was going to dump it because she wasn't happy with um, you know, the things breaking down and et cetera. I had promised her 20 years with no, no problems, but that I discovered in, a, in an 1883 house, even though my stuff doesn't break down, hers seems to have. So let's look at these numbers of what I did with it. All right, so first of all, I wanted to see what we could get for it because I was initially thinking, 185 even though the house next door had gone for 170 it, my neighborhood is in an up-and-coming area like the city does um some projects in in they they're redoing areas as they do the water sewer lines and stuff like that and so my neighborhood for single family homes it's pulling ridiculous ridiculous appreciation than what houses are selling for. So honestly, I felt like this one could go for more than 100 and the 170 that the one next door to it. And I, I tried it at 185. Now, granted, when I was working those numbers, I was doing it wrong and I didn't come back to it. But um, so I, I dropped it down to 175 just to see what it would look like. Um, the, the one that this, this particular one, 208 Harrison is an up and down duplex. And it's all, it's been completely gutted and renovated within the last five years. So, however, um, my hard headed friend would not put um, storm windows onto the original 1880, um, you know, windows. So I, I kept telling her if she would do that, she'd be able to get higher rents because she wouldn't have to worry about people paying $200 a month in the, in the um, winter with their heating bills. But she didn't listen to me and she still isn't going to put another penny into it. But even though I found out she could get those for, for $4,500 and I believe it would help itself or higher, but 
there we go. We're here's this is where we are. So again, we're at eighteen thousand dollars for a gross rent. Um, thankfully, I haven't had any vacancy rates whatsoever, but we'll still go with that one. So let's flip down to the bottom. All right, and then seller, thankfully, I split out her water, I split out her meter. So seller does not have any operating expenses in this home whatsoever. She doesn't pay water, she doesn't even pay trash, nothing. So her net operating income is 13,584. She actually doesn't have any debt on it whatsoever, but we're gonna put that in for the sake of the calculation for the, you know, the person who's gonna buy it. And so look, we have a $3,400 a month cash flow before taxes. That would be your annual cash flow. Yeah, yeah. So the cap rate is, I think, I think it's pretty high, but that that is reflecting, I think, the general consensus. People in my town don't always like to be in an historic district because we do have restrictions of what we can do with our property. But again, like it's like I said, it's been selling so high. So that was just interesting to me. And if we flip back up to cash on cash for this one, we have an 8.8 percent. So I didn't think that was too bad either. So just so you know, one more piece of um, um, information: the the house two doors down, two ten two twelve Harrison, was bought by an investor. And their plan is to make a whole bunch more money than just renting it out by the month. They're going to use it as an Airbnb, which is mm. getting astronomical amounts of money in our town too. We have yeah. seven colleges in our town. So when we have, you know, alumni weekend and um, kids coming in and kids going out and, you know, all that stuff, uh, we do have a lot of visitors in town and Airbnb is popular. All right. So let's, let's, wow. let's have fun. All right. So, this is what Tom and I were, were looking at. What would we do to these properties? What, would, what does it look like? So we have 1103 Rivermont. So what would you guys do? Would you raise or lower the price on 1103 Rivermont? That was that, that one on um, the, the one we talked about most recently, the duplex. And look at our numbers. What do you think? Would you guys raise it, lower it, or leave it where it is? So it's been sitting on the market 103 days plus, not selling at 184.9. Does it look like it really, but with the cap rate and with the cash flow, do you think that somebody could do okay with it if they bought it for more? Oh, Christina says yes. Okay. I think for me, better part of valor is I would leave it alone. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the one at Rolling Hill, the one that had just a very small cash on cash return. Obviously, they got away with it. Would you guys have been brave enough to price it out at 225 if you were a listing agent that actually knew what you were doing? <laughs> <laughs> Alexandra, rate increases on which one? Anita Davis says no, she would not have priced it to 25. Uh -huh. Okay. Rivermont. Oh, to raise rates on Rivermont. Um, I think probably not much, if anything if it was rented again as a duplex, probably not much. I think I would leave that one all the way alone. All right, so let's go to 208 Harrison Street because I have to put this on the market mid-July. Mm -hmm. So what do you guys think? Should I put it on the market for 175 or do you think I can go up? Granted, we just had the comp right next door to it. It'll be only like eight weeks now. And it's a very comparable property and they only got 170. But what do the numbers look like? What do you guys think about the numbers? Hmm. Yeah, your your average numbers are showing that there is a potential to, to start higher. Yeah. 
I think so too. I think I might be able to get my 185. What do you guys think? Will the recent comp hurt me? Do you think I won't be able to get it right next door? 15,000 higher? And just you, go ahead. I was just thinking, I was looking at it, I was just thinking. Yeah. What do you uh, think, Tony? I'd, I'd be aggressive and do it, but that's just me. Who else has an opinion? Help me out. <laughs> Christina says, are, what are the differences in the upgrades between the two properties, 208 and, and 210? Um, they are sort of comparable. So we put a brand new roof on 208. The other one was painted poorly. Um, 210 to 12 has storm windows, <laughs> which helps. 210 to 12 is a um, side by side, and I think people tend to like that better. The noise is um, different, you know, the, there's not as much noise going from upstairs and downstairs. I think that's a big deal. Um, 208 got very nicely painted last year. Um, it's, it's cute. It's just the, the apartments feel smaller because they are all on one floor. However, the point of these is, you know, sometimes people are buying duplexes so that they have a basically no, um, no mortgage payment because the other side's paying for it. So we have the potential for first time home buyers. We do have kitty condos that um, a lot of people are going to be flowing in at the mid July, which is why I want to put on the market then to start getting houses for their kids so they don't pay, you know, college rents. Um, and then you do have the Airbnbs and, you know, just the basic investors. So I have a lot of options for potential buyers. Yeah, I, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't worry about 210, 212, because it sounds like they're slightly different properties. And eight weeks in today's market is a decade ago. Okay. Yeah, that is true. Um, what do you guys think about pricing at 175 and hope that it gets bid up so it's passive aggressive instead of aggressive? <laughs> <We're quite passive>. <laughs> <laughs> Where I live, I mean, properties are going well 50 plus over what you price it at at a good price. So it's crazy right now. Yeah. 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 Michael's saying that's a good strategy. It's. I agree. Just... You do agree, Jeff? Yeah. Uh, up here in uh, the Boston market, uh, it has been really hot since before COVID hit. Uh, and uh, even last year, we, we thought we were going to hit a bad market. Uh, and things were very overpriced. And uh, the things that the properties that got the best uh, jump in, in profit for the seller were the ones that were slightly under market. Yeah. When it was listed. And they created a, a, a harder bidding war between all the buyers. Uh, mm -hmm. So, because you, you got a greater pool of people that, was, that said, oh, I want to grab that property. Right. So, yeah, I, I, Hopefully it is the same for you down there in Lynchburg. Oh. Hi. Hi, Benetta. Hi, Benetta. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm in the DC market. I'm in Northern Virginia. And I'd have to agree with, I'm sorry, I don't know the gentleman's name. P.F. Um, who just spoke. And I agree with him. If you price it comparable to the other one, you're apt to draw more people um, that's, oh my God, considering all the other ones, this is great. So then you can drive the market up. Yeah. We're closer to what you want. But if you start at the top, mm, people could look at it and get discouraged. So mm -hmm. I agree with the last person. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> yeah, I know some, we're, yeah, I agree. 
All right, I think that's about all we have, right? I don't Last know. Q and A. Uh, oh, 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 yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. So Tom's going to teach us how to use the portion of that sheet that I couldn't figure out whatsoever. No, I'm not. You asked to discuss it. So you have to discuss it. Oh, but I don't know how to. OK, no, I'm gonna okay. Let you, do it. you guys, I want to encourage you if you haven't used this sheet yet. This is a good way to um, put together your data that Tom was encouraging to us to do earlier. Has anybody really used this form yet much? I have. Okay, well, it's in the member services under tools. I would recommend you to that. Okay, go, Tom. Okay, so um, one one other number that that comes into play is the debt service coverage ratio. So Gary's got that in there, DCR Bank, uh, and banks look at when a commercial lender is looking to lend, they want to make sure that there's sufficient cash flow coming in to cover the debt service. Uh, and I, I found a general uh, percentage that they're looking at 1.25. So basically, you know, much more cash than what the debt service is going to be. Uh, and there's ways to change that number. Uh, this was on a either a 20 or 20 percent down payment so you could you could increase that ratio by putting more money down uh, but that's a figure that you may hear working with investors who are using commercial lenders and they they ask what the dcr is uh, and so that that calculates by taking the um, noi your net operating income and dividing it by your debt service and so you can adjust those numbers. You can play with those numbers to get a value that a bank is going to be receptive to. Um, you know, looking at your whole uh, investment package on a particular property. So basically, it's cash to cover the loan. And then the right hand side is what if. So if you've got um, some, uh, if you're looking at a particular property and you're looking at uh, saying, okay, they're asking a, a 6% cap rate, but really it should be a 7% cap rate property. And you plug that in, it'll, it'll back engineer the numbers and say, okay, this is what the value really should be. And if you're going to do improvements on a property um, and change in the range, you can plug in a, a lower cap rate and see what the value increase is going to be. If you do any kind of refinancing, you can plug in, um, you know, if you're going to do a 50% refi, it can tell you what the proceeds are and any cash out on it. So those are, those are th uh, pieces of the spreadsheet that you're not going to use much, but just so you understand what they are. Don't stress out over those. And we are done. So I'm going to stop sharing. I like sharing, but I'm going to stop sharing the screen. So any uh, questions, if there's any comments, they can only be nice ones. Yes, I, I do have a comment. Yes. I, I want to thank you. I am new to the group. Um, and I want to thank you, Tom and Susan, for making this whole thing very approachable. That would be fun. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> Well, even, even you, Susan, when you said, yeah. oh, I messed up doing this part, <laughs> that, yes. that gave me permission to, to, so to mess it up. Yes. Because yeah. I, I, I was like looking at all these spreadsheets and it was like, oh, my God, I'm going to have an aneurysm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, it was after like I did about eight of them. I thought, wait a minute, I've been doing these all wrong. I have to go back and do all of them over again. But it's good because it gets the formulas in your head and stuff for the most part. So it's good to know it's good practicing on, on them. So it would be good for you guys to do your practicing. And, yeah, and definitely. To a purpose and get your data together. I'm going to do that. And I, I would make a suggestion uh, to PF and any anyone who's newer to the team. There are uh, Tony on this call, um, uh, Shirley on this call, Chris on this call, have a lot of information and experience. Teresa on the call, Christina Coleman, um, 
you know, just just with with the the team, a lot of information, and they're givers. Uh, David Edwards, Gina, uh, are givers as well. So as you have questions or struggles with any of this stuff, reach out to you know, uh, do it in the workplace chat or email us directly. Uh, but use us. That was something that I didn't realize when uh, I came on the team last fall. Uh, it, it was a tremendous added benefit. And I, it looks like I, I feel like I've got counselors throughout the country right now. So that, that's really neat for me. And I, I didn't expect that, you know, stepping in. I appreciate that, Tom. Thank you. I will heed your advice. Yes, sir. You guys, thank you all so much for coming. It was fun to be with you. Thanks, Tom and Susan. You did a great job. I appreciate yep. it. Yes, thank you so much. This was very well presented and made it much simpler than it seemed. <laughs> yeah, good. Well, thank you all. So, well, I don't know, because then they might volunteer us to do it again, Susan. <laughs> no, they all have a drink. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> What <laughs> once uh once every six months we'll do it <laughs> man i tell you what it was so awesome working with tom he knows so much he just pulled me right on through so I, it was it, i would recommend volunteering because you do learn it. when you have to you learn it so oh yes yeah 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 but it Very was good. Joy. thanks guys all right thank you guys so we got the team stuff that is it the team gias the regional gias next week uh yes it is. Yes. Yep. So get that information out. Gary's going to be teaching the class. So all you got to do is uh, get people, send people the link. So very good. Well, everybody have a great evening. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. The recording is stopped.